Welcome everybody to the NFL presidential address for week eight and shout out to all of you guys who purchased my 5% play on Monday, Baltimore Ravens, Tampa Bay Buccaneers over 50, never in doubt. And that's how we're going to start week eight. Okay, so if you've never bumped into this uh, video before, I'm going to go down every single game on Sunday and give you guys analysis on each game and tell you exactly how I would attack betting it. Let's start right off the bat with Tennessee going into Detroit. And here we have Detroit at minus 11 with a total of 45 and a half. Now I'm going to make this quick. We all know how I feel about the Lions, as we have been successfully betting them every single week. We had them at plus one and a half against Minnesota, even down two scores to start. They still came back and dominated that football game until a turnover made it close. But cash that ticket. Yes, we did. So here we have a, a minus 11. And I'm asking myself, is that supposed to scare me? Is that supposed to scare us off this team? Is that supposed to make us bet the Titans? I don't think so. Let me think this over. Now, I, I'm good. I'm going to bet Detroit. The Lions it is. So here's what we know. The Lions are going to get us 30 points every single game they play. Uh, so the only question I have right now is, can Tennessee get us to 19? And the answer is, hell no. They just put up 10 on Buffalo, 17 on Indianapolis. And other than that Miami game, which uh, was a clear aberration and a lot of turnovers, they have not gone over 17 points in any other game this year. Their output is exactly this, 17, 17, 14, 31, 17, and 10. So why should we think they're going to get 19 here? The Lions' D is not terrible. They are pressuring the QB at a very high level. And it doesn't matter to me whether Rudolph or any of his reindeers play. They're not getting to 19 points. This game is 34-13 written all over it. Total blowout, Detroit Lions, best team in football, minus 11. Next up is the Baltimore Ravens, and they're playing the Cleveland Browns. I'm going to make this really, really easy. I am looking to play the Baltimore team total over. Now, that number has not officially come out yet, but if it's anything near, say, 26 points, 25 points, I'm going to go with the over in that game. I can't find a side here. Minus 10 and a half is a lot. And I know Cleveland sucks and the Ravens are unstoppable. But man, I don't know if we're going to get the Ravens' best effort in this game. Uh, and crazy things happen in these division rivalry games. I think the safest way to bet this is for the Ravens to get points on the board, as they seem to do that every single game. Now let's turn our attention to Green Bay, minus four and a half. And they're playing Jacksonville here. And the total in this game is 51. We were on Green Bay last week on the money line and it cashed. But they did not cover the minus two and a half spread. Now they go into Jacksonville. And I think this is a very, very bad spot for this Green Bay team. Look, it's not the best spot for Jacksonville, flat out. Two weeks in London, England. Now they're back home. Normally, I wouldn't want to be betting Jacksonville here, but this is a horrible, horrible spot for the Green Bay Packers. The game following this one sees Green Bay playing, well, you guessed it, the Detroit Lions. That's clearly going to be the biggest game they have played so far this season and a game that could end up dictating the division. After the, they play the Lions, they then have another division rivalry game against the Bears, and after that, a conference rivalry game with playoff seed implications with the San Francisco 49ers. This is one of those look-ahead games where we will not get Green Bay at their very best. Now, the only question is, can Green Bay at 80% cover minus 4.5 on the road against the Jags? And I don't think they can. 
The Jags finally got a decent win last week, beating the Patriots. I know it's not really that great, but hey, a win's a win. 32-16, and the Jags have won two of their last three games. They're also, frankly, playing for their coach's career. I also like that the Jags found some balance to their offense last week. They ran the ball 39 times for 171 yards, and Fabio was 20 for 25 and 193 yards. Those are really good numbers that suggest this team might be able to find their rhythm. Speaking of rhythm, hardest word in the English language to spell. Try it. So here we have a Green Bay team in a horrible, horrible spot on the road with their most important game of the season coming up next playing a Jags team who looks like they're starting to turn their season around. Four and a half points seems like a lot here, especially on the road, and especially with the fact that Jag the Jaguars at least have the offensive capability of finding us a backdoor cover. We're going to take the dog here, and I wouldn't be blown away if the Jags win outright. Take Jacksonville plus four and a half. Now, before we get into our next game, which is Indianapolis and Houston, I just want to say couple of things. Number one, it's really important for you guys to like this video. Click thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated and it really helps our algorithm. Um, YouTube has a lot of competitors to choose between to uh, deliver to you guys to watch. And I want them to choose us, me, this video. So in order to do that, we need a like. We need you guys to comment on this video. I read all the comments and respond to a lot. And subscribe to our channel. It takes one second to do all of that. Please do. I really, really appreciate it. Also, we have an incredible promotion up this week, and it's in November, uh, right around the corner, and we're entering the busiest time of the year. We have decided to put up an all-access promotion for the next month. It is $249, no coupon code required, for a month of all of my sports. Now, to give you perspective, my NHL is amazing, unbelievable. I've just dominated that sports for three and a half decades. My NFL is slightly down on the season, but I am seeing it much better after a horrible first two-week start, and I expect to have an incredible month. NFL is a sport I've built my reputation on and one I've been winning at for three and a half decades. And my NBA, which starts now, I made 95 units of profit the last two years combined. My NBA has been outstanding. As well, I'm up profit in both the last two years of college basketball as well. So please, if you're going to play a handicapper, don't buy just one day. Dive in, take a leap of faith, trust me with your money. $249, $8 a day. Let's win together. Okay, Indianapolis against Houston. India's plus six. The total in this game is 46. This is a tough, tough game to handicap. I'm not going to get to the window uh, on this game at all, but if I had to bet it, I would take Indy and the points. These two teams played each other twice last year, and both times Houston won. But neither times did they cover the number six. They won one game by two points and one game by four. I don't think this Houston team is that much better than the Indy team is in relation to how they both were last year. I think, in, if anything, Indianapolis has improved a little bit. This is just too many points for a division game and a game where the division is actually on the line. With that said, if Pittman and Downs do not play and Taylor remains out, I would just lay off this game completely. But if we see a healthy Indianapolis coming into this game, even without Jonathan Taylor, I would take Indy at plus six. Next is Arizona and Miami. And guys, I got nothing on this game. Uh, the Arizona game ended late last night, and I was simply unable to take this game apart in great detail. The total of this game is 48, and I will tell you this. I'm going to handicap this game in the next few days, and I am leaning to the under in this football game. 48 seems very high, especially against an Arizona offense that is really, really struggling. Plus, Miami's D is outstanding so far this year. So although I haven't fully handicapped this game in great detail, I am already leaning on the under. Now we turn our attention to Atlanta 
They're playing Tampa Bay. And well, before the game started last night, Tampa Bay was minus two and a half. Now Atlanta is minus two and a half. And the total in this game is 48, dropped down to 46. Now I get it. Not only is this a total overreaction to how bad Tampa Bay played, but hey, Tampa Bay just lost one and two of their wide receiving core. Evans and Godwin likely out this coming uh, Sunday, and that is a huge loss. With that said, this Tampa Bay D was eaten alive by Baltimore. I mean, uh, it was like a food orgy for the Baltimore Ravens on Monday night. Over 500 yards, one massive play after another, one long run, one long bomb, one long run, one long bomb, and on and on and on and on. Now, don't get me wrong. This Ravens offense is basically unstoppable. But Tampa has some seriously huge defensive issues. Baltimore just put up 41 on them. And guys, it could have been worse. The no offense New Orleans Saints scored 27 against this Tampa Bay D. And this very Falcons team literally two weeks ago scored 36 on them. These two teams played two weeks ago, and I know Evans and Godwin played, I get it. There was 66 points scored in that game. What has changed? Okay, Evans and Godwin, they've changed. Evans will be out, and that'll suck for Tampa Bay. But this is a high-flying do-or-die offense regardless. No matter who is playing wide receiver for Tampa Bay, Baker Mayfield only knows one speed. High speed. They throw. He throws short. He throws medium. He throws long. When Baker is on, you can count on successful bombs. When he's off, you can count on successful pick sixes. Without Evans, without Godwin, it doesn't matter. Baker is who he is. He's a gunslinger, and he's going to whip the ball all around the field no matter what. This Tampa Bay offense had a rough one against Baltimore and still scored 31 points. Before that, they put up 51 on New Orleans, 30 on the Falcons, and 33 on Philadelphia. I love the over at 48. Now it's 46. Hello, lover. We're going to extra love the over. As for the Falcons, they stunk against Seattle, but they will bounce back. Before that, they scored 38, 36, and 26. And playing Tampa Bay, well, if you have a bad offense or you have a moment, a, a week where you play badly on offense and you need a cure, play Tampa Bay. I think we see Tampa Bay get a minimum of 24 points, and I think we see Atlanta get a minimum of 24 points. As for the side, I like Atlanta in this game, guys. I think it'll be the Falcons all the way. I know it's hard to beat the same team twice in a season and especially twice in a month, but I just think this Falcons team is better. The game against Seattle were one of those bad games where things just didn't bounce right. Too many turnovers, the game got away from the Falcons, but this team was just starting to click. Bottom line here, guys, I like the Falcons. I like the over even better. That's where I stand on the Atlanta-Tampa Bay game. If you're enjoying this video, please take a second and hit that like button. Let's turn our attention to Chicago. Minus three, now minus two and a half against Washington. A total of 44 been bet down to 43 and a half. And what a damn shame. It looks like Jaden Daniels will be out in the Jaden versus Caleb uh, first matchup of their career will not happen. As of Tuesday, when taping this show, I just don't know if he's playing or not. And clearly, it is crucial that he plays. The line suggests that he is not playing. So with that said, I'm going to pass on this game. But if for some reason he plays, I like Washington here, guys. The vibe coming out of that dressing room is spectacular. And I also don't, I also like Marcus Moriota as well. I think he's one of the better backup QBs in the league. If I had to bet this game, even without Jaden, I would take Washington. With Jaden, I'm all over Washington. I would take Washington all the way to minus three. Okay, 
New York Jets, minus seven. On the road, playing New England, a total here of 41 and a half. Honestly, F the damn Jets. I was stupid enough to think they had turned the corner and were going to beat the Steelers. Then, yeah, that didn't work out. They were terrible. Not only did they turn the ball over at the worst possible times, but Aaron Rodgers is just not a high-caliber quarterback anymore, which is just fine with me because you're a big mouth, you're a goof, your energy is shit. I don't like anything about you, and frankly, you can just go off into the sunset and never be heard of again. Okay, that was a side note. Don't really care how I feel about people. Uh, not important in my handicapping, but Aaron Rodgers, stick it. Okay, so with that said, we have seen a whole different Pats team since May started behind center. Uh, I know they're losing still, but hey, they're moving the ball. They're playing more aggressively against the Jags. May was 26 for 37, 275 yards and two touchdowns. Those are really solid numbers, guys. And numbers that suggest they too can cover a wide open, extremely large back door. I'm not going to go on and on here. This is way too many points for a team that is two and five, a team that is miserable. They have issues coming out of their dressing room. Uh, they have a dickwad of a quarterback who can't seem to throw the ball to the right receiver. Uh, I'm taking the Pats. Go Pats. Plus seven. Win this game, would you? Okay, breathe. The Aaron Rodgers hate segment is over. Let's move our attention to Buffalo playing Seattle. Buffalo here is minus three. The total in this game is 47, and I got to look to the over here, guys. Is there any other way to bet it? Let's bottom line this. Buffalo scored over 28 points per game, and Seattle scored 26 points per game. That alone is 54 points. That is a full touchdown over the current total. Now, I understand that Buffalo is holding teams to just under 20 points per game. But this Seattle offense is going to score. And one thing we know about the Bills, they will keep up. Seattle just put 34 up on Atlanta, 24 on San Fran, and they have scored 20 or more points in every single game this season. Other than the Giants debacle, this Seattle team should put up a minimum of 24 points. Now, I understand that DK Metcalf might not play. And yes, that is a big deal. However, Buffalo's going to get their points. Seattle's going to need to keep up. Lockett is still playing. They still have uh, weapons. Uh, this is it. Geno Smith airs the ball up, long bombs all the time. They're still going to find their points. So if Seattle can put up 24 and the line is Buffalo minus three, we should assume at least 27 from the Bills. That equals 51, more than a field goal over the current total. Impressive D by, by Seattle last week. Just want to shout them out. But that was an aberration. Before last week against the Falcons, the Seattle team let San Fran put up 36, the New York Giants 29, and the Detroit Lions 42. Every single team but the injured Dolphins have scored 20 or more on the Seattle team. From a side perspective, I would lean on the Hawks here. They are at home as a field goal dog, and they just played their best game of the season. On top of that, the Bills are not as good as their record. Their D is susceptible, and their offense hasn't truly been in sync all year. I am not likely to bet the Hawks here because, well, I'm going to bet the over. Takes Buffalo and Seattle over the total of 47. Did you hit the like button? Yes, you did. If you didn't, Please take a second and do so. New Orleans, plus seven and a half, playing the LA Chargers. The total in this game is 40. 40! 40 points. Now, I understand that there should be a four in this total. It should be after a three, as in 34. How is this game 40 points? This Chargers team is number one in the league in defense, and I don't think the Saints can score 20 points here. No chance. Frankly, I would be surprised if the Saints put up more than 13, and I don't care who's playing quarterback. 
I know the New Orleans D is terrible. I get it. Allowing 26 points a game. But I just don't think the Chargers will be able to take advantage of that. No, New Orleans cannot stop the pass. And honestly, I don't think the Chargers care. They're still not going to throw the ball deep all the game long. They're going to play their game regardless of opposition. And that equates to a conservative, ball control, slow-moving, methodical approach. Let me bottom line this. The Chargers are not going to score much. They have put up 15, 23, 10, and 10 in their last four games. And they are not going to allow New Orleans to score much. Only one team has scored 20 points against the Chargers, and that was Pittsburgh. Oh, my God. Even Kansas City struggled against this defense. They only put up 17. As for the Saints, take out those two games to start the season, and they have scored 10, 27, 13, 24, and 12 in their last five games. How is this game getting anywhere near 40 points? Close your eyes and predict a score. What do you get? 13-10, 17-13, maybe, maybe at the most, a couple of pick sixes, 20 to 17. This game still stays under. Take New Orleans and the LA Chargers under the total. Philly, Cincy. Before we get into that, a quick reminder, guys, buy that $249 package, a full all access month to every single sport and every bet that I have. I have a 5% play up again this Sunday. It'll include my 5% play. So please, $8 a day. This is the way to win buying plays from us experts over at Wager Talk. Take advantage of the offer, $249 for an all-access month. Okay, Philly, plus two and a half against Cincinnati. Total here, 47 and a half. Even though Philly is holding teams to 19.2 points per game, that number is phony, as that number includes playing the Giants and the Browns. This D did allow Green Bay to score 29 on them. Atlanta put up 22 on them. Tampa Bay put up 33 on them. Plus, let's be honest here. Since he is going to score, I know they only put up 21 against the Browns and 17 against the Giants, but they were winning those games from start to finish, and they really just didn't need to put up a whole bunch of points. When Cincinnati needs to score, they score. When Baltimore puts up 41 on Cincinnati, the Bengals put up 38. When Carolina puts up 24 on them, the Bengals put up 34. When Washington scores 38 on them, they score 33. And they even put up 25 against the mighty KC defense. So to me, the only question here is how many points will Philadelphia get? They just scored 28 on the Giants and 20 on the Browns. Their offense is finally healthy and showing signs of life. Sure, Hurts only went 10 for 14, 114 yards, but he did throw a 41-yard touchdown pass to Brown, and they were ahead the entire game and ran the ball over and over and over and over again. The game before that, Hurts was 16 for 25. Again, not a ton of throws, but he did throw the ball 264 yards. He had two touchdowns, including a 40-yarder and a 45-yarder. We know Philly can score and score fast. We know Cincinnati can score and score fast. Cincinnati also has a bottom half of the league pasty, and that is after playing Cleveland and the Giants. Before those two games, they were a bottom five pasty. I think we see Philly score 24 points minimum in this game and get some long bomb TDs. Frankly, I could see them get to 30, and we know, I think, since he can keep pace, this is going to be the highest scoring game of the week. Take Cincinnati and Philadelphia over 47 and a half. Now we turn our attention to Kansas City. They are minus 10 against the Raiders. Total here is 41 and a half. And while I am such a moron, I bet against Kansas City last week again, and I lost again. No matter how you look at this, 
The numbers lie. Yes, the numbers lie. KC offensively have struggled in every single game. Mahomes has more interceptions than touchdowns. They have no wide receiver, and everyone is keying in on Kelsey. None of that matters. Throw that all out of the window. The numbers lie. All this Kansas City team does is get it done. They've gotten it done in every game this season. So what do we do in this game? Well, I'm not going to take the points at minus 10. I'm actually going to look to play right into Kansas City's strength. I'm taking the under. This Kansas City D is one of, if not the best defense units in football. San Fran was held to 18 points, New Orleans 13, LA Chargers 10, and Atlanta 17. Only one team all year, only one time all year as a team scored 20 or more on this D, and that was Cincinnati who put up 25. How many actual points do you think the Raiders are going to be able to score here? The Raiders just put up 15 on the Chargers, 13 on Pittsburgh, 18 on Denver, and 20 on the Browns. All those defenses are good. But other than the Chargers, maybe, I think Kansas City is better. But more importantly, and this is a huge factor, Chargers, Pittsburgh, Denver, Browns, none of those teams hold the ball for long extended eight-minute drives keeping their opponent's offense off the field. This Kansas City team is extending drives like no one's business. They're using all three downs to move the chains. They're putting together long, extended, methodical seven-minute drives that usually result in a field goal. So not only is Kansas City's defense incredible, but the Raiders' offense simply might not see the field. We are also seeing KC run the ball a lot, especially in the second half, and especially when they are up by two scores, which is exactly where they should be in this game. The other thing that helps us under is that KC, they're kicking a whole lot of field goals. They're going on these eight-minute drives and ending with three points. Perfect for the under. I also should point out that Vegas' strength is stopping the pass, and their weakness is stopping the run. Another thing that helps the under. Take Kansas City and the Raiders under the total. Now let's turn our attention to Carolina, plus eight against Denver, 43 and a half. And this is a big number, 43 and a half for the fifth and sixth worst passing teams in all of football. I get it. The Panthers' defense is horrible. I mean, historically bad and have allowed almost five touchdowns a game against them. Yes. They have averaged allowing their opponents 34.7 points per game. And yet, I still like the under. I just don't think the Panthers can put up more than 10 points in this game. They only scored seven on Washington. They only scored 10 on the Bears. And that's in two of their last three games. And neither, and Washington certainly doesn't have a defense like Denver does. I don't even think Chicago has a defense like Denver does. I know Denver just put up 33 on New Orleans, but they held New Orleans to 10 points and the game still went under 43 and a half. And that is with Denver putting up 33 points. I can't expect this Broncos team to put up 33 points on a regular basis. I frankly think they score around 21 in most of the games they play. Even if they put up 33, Carolina puts up 10. That's still under. 27-10 27-10 feels like the right number to me, and that's almost a full touchdown under the total. Take Carolina and Denver under. As for the Monday, the Sunday night game, Dallas and San Fran, I have not handicapped this game in full yet. I'm waiting on the injury report for San Francisco. I will give this game out likely on Wager Talk today on either Thursday or Friday to make up for not doing it now. It just, I can't. Handicap this game without seeing the San Francisco 49ers injury report. But I am looking at taking Dallas plus the points and over the total. That's it for the NFL presidential address for week eight. Lots of love, everybody. Please remember to like this video. Please remember to put up comments. Tell me who you guys are betting. What are your favorite three plays this week? Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.